I'm Mark Oppenheimer, and this is The Colin McEnroe Show. This is my second day co-hosting or guest hosting for Colin, who, from what I hear, is riding a tandem bicycle from Paris to somewhere in Germany. That's a true story. He will be back in two weeks to tell you all about his trip. But in the meantime, it's an honor to be here. Today, we're talking about alternative birthing or the varieties of birthing or all the different ways that women and their partners helping them give birth today. Uh, It used to be some time ago that Well, you went to the hospital, they knocked you out, you woke up, you had a baby, and maybe there was a father somewhere pacing with a cigar. But that's not how it happens today. And uh, as someone who's just gone through the process, well, not myself, but near my wife, uh, yet again, it's, it's of particular interest to me. Our guest today, Dr. Peter Beller, is the medical director of the Women's Ambulatory Health Services at Hartford Hospital. Lillian Siegel is a certified nurse midwife at Birth and Beyond in Madison, Connecticut, and is a prenatal yoga teacher. Julie Robbins is a prenatal massage specialist. And Barbara Fasulo is the coordinator of the Center for Integrative Medicine at St. Francis Hospital and a hypnobirthing educator. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, you, Mark. They're all here in the studio with us. I should also say that this is a topic I expect some of you out there in Radioland might have something to say about. And you can call us. We're at 860-275-7266. 860-275-7266. We would love to take your calls. What was your birthing experience? Was it ideal? Was it less than ideal? Are you angry about it? Are you still talking about how wonderful it was? You can also tweet us. Our Twitter handle is WNPR Colin. That's Twitter at WNPR Colin. Uh, Peter, let's start with you. How are you today? Good, thank you. Good. And you? Uh, I'm, I'm great. So um, you've been, how long have you been a practicing physician l- working with births? Uh, since 1985. 1985. So in almost 30 years, how have things changed? Um, well, uh, I think that uh, we have taken an um, approach to try and provide care for our patients that they have more, um, I don't want to say control, but they have more input into. Okay, so, but break that down for me. What exactly does that mean? Um, well, uh, we try to give them some options of whether they, you know, they want to be up and walking around. It's It's not... It's where the physicians, I think, in all of medicine have relinquished some of their, quote, unquote, control that they used to think they had over patients. So are you you seeing more women choosing, for example, home birthing? Are you seeing more people going with midwives, people resisting cesarean sections who might have wanted one? I mean, what are are the trends that we're seeing? Well, we see – I think we're seeing – uh, at Hartford Hospital, I think we started – when I was in private practice, we started with the first midwife, and I can't remember exactly how long ago that was, probably 10 or 12 years ago or so. And since that time, the midwifery practices at Hartford Hospital have increased. Um, in our clinic, we have midwives. Um, so that's, a, that's an option that's come to Hartford Hospital within the last 10 years or so. Um, uh, y- you know, it's it's hard to say one individual thing. Um, we do a lot of cesarean sections. Our cesarean rate is probably in the thirty percent range, give or take. On a, um, is that going to change a lot? Uh, probably not. Um, it may go down a little bit. It may go up a little bit. Um, some women are requesting cesarean section on request, where they want to have a cesarean section. You know, that may sound okay. Now, why funny. would they do? Th- I've actually, I, <laughs> so, I I don't know. D- does any of our other guests know why would someone request a cesarean section? Well, some people are afraid of the pain and the, and the labor process itself. That doesn't mean that a cesarean section is painless because it isn't. I've seen the um, aftermath of a cesarean section. That's no fun either. Right. right. Correct. Okay. So we, and we know that that's not as safe for our babies as having a vaginal birth. So, um, you know, we try to resist that, but there are places that – and I've, have, have I done it? Yes, I have. Um, you know, if you have a good conversation with the patient and you think she really understands why she and her partner have made that decision, then, yeah, I think we can provide that. But it's some of the autonomy that has, you know, come out of medicine that allows – not allows is not the right word, but there's more of a of a, a conversation between physicians and their patients in today's world. Um, we're going to go to Julie Robbins in just a second, who's gesturing like she has something to say. But I want to say we're we're talking about alternative birthing and varieties of birthing. Um, I would love to hear from anyone who might have requested a cesarean section. You can call us at eight six zero two seven five seven two six six. Julie Robbins is a prenatal massage specialist in Woodbridge, Connecticut, in the Greater New Haven area. What were you going to say, Julie? Hi, Mark. I was g- going to ask Peter. Actually, in your experience, what percentage of the C-sections that you see at Hartford are requested? Because oh. my understanding is it's actually much smaller than the media might present it to be. That's true. I mean, I, I don't know the percentage, but mm-hmm. it's not 
doesn't happen on a daily basis. Let's put it that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Probably mm-hmm. not even a weekly or a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. So um, I could be so wrong about this. I think I think Jennifer Lopez requested a cesarean. I, I could be wrong about that. My People magazine reading tells me that somewhere back there in my mind uh, is J-Lo requesting a well, cesarean. If you, for it, and in certain parts of the world, in Brazil, it's pretty common. Uh-huh. Um, I, Brazil has, a, I don't know the exact percentage, but a, a very high cesarean section rate. And some of that is driven by cesarean by request. And that's is that tied into their plastic surgery culture, yes. do we think? Yes. Okay, gotcha. So, also, yeah, Lillian Siegel, go I ahead. I also add, you know, our maternity... We should say that you're a midwife, I, and I, I want, we should repeat here that you're a certified, a nurse, certified midwife nurse midwife at Birth and Beyond in Madison. Beyond. Go ahead. Um, in, our, in our country, we don't have the best system for maternity leave and for um, paying women to be at home with their families after their babies are born. And so some people maybe think if I can plan when my baby will come, I know I'll be able to have more time to recover after and to take care of my baby and maybe the children that I have at home. So that is sometimes a reason for choosing, trying to request a date to know when your baby will be born, you know, via C-section. So we actually might be driving people into elective surgeries that they otherwise wouldn't want because it allows them to control maternity leave and have more time with their babies. It can be one factor. That's rather. That, that's, that's one thing that, that um, for other reasons as well, that uh, the so-called VBAC or TOLAC or trial of labor after cesarean or vaginal birth after cesarean sometimes doesn't sit well with some patients because, as, as you said, they allow if you pick your date of your cesarean section it allows you to know when it's going to happen and so you can have family come in and all that kind of stuff so we do see that as some reason why women request a a repeat cesarean section, not necessarily the first one, but a repeat cesarean section. So, Dr. Peter Beller, we were talking a second ago about the increase in the, the number of midwives who work at Hartford Hospital correct. and the, the people. You're an obstetrician. That's and correct. So, from your point of view as someone who's not a midwife, uh, I mean, sometimes from the media you get the perception that there is um, – that there are uh, hostilities between traditional OBGYNs and midwives, um, that there are sort of conflicts. How has it been in your experience? I don't. I don't think there's any conflict. I think as long as – the, the practicing midwives and the practicing obstetrician gynecologists have a, uh, a, a way of communicating uh, civilly and, uh, and upfront, um, and that the transfer of patients when needed occurs at a t- in a timely fashion, um, and everybody works together. I think we're all in the same business of having healthy babies and healthy moms. However you do that, you do it. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't have any problem with midwifery practice. I think midwifery practice is appropriate for lots of patients. And as is, if you look at other areas of medicine, the use of APRNs and physician's assistants um, to, you know, to provide care. What's, a, what's an APRN? Uh, Advanced it's Practice pr- Registered Nurse, nurse thank practitioners. Th- thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lillian. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, you know, so... It's not just in obstetrics that that we have providers. It's like going to the dentist and having having the dental hygienist, the hygienist clean right. your teeth mm-hmm. instead of the dentist. So, you know, can the dentist do it? Sure. Can the de- can a hygienist do it? Yes, yeah, she probably does it, or she or he probably does it better. So, you know, so I, I don't think there's a problem, and I think you just have to be open about that relationship. Um, I think sometimes there are patients who are hostile towards the medical profession in general, um, and their desires to um, do what some of us think are crazy and not well thought out things lead to problems. Um, you know, occasionally uh, it happens, not not commonly, but not infrequently. We're talking about varieties of birthing. This is the Colin McEnroe Show. I'm Mark Oppenheimer sitting in for Colin. We're taking your calls at 860-275-7266. That's 860-275-7266. Tell us about your experience with the birthing profession, or I should say birthing professions. Did you use a hypnobirth or did you have a water birth? Did you use a midwife, a doula, um, a prenatal massage, a therapist? Lillian Siegel, we were just talking about um, midwifery. Why did you become a midwife? I came from more of an interest in reproductive justice and um, access for contraception and abortion and um, then realized I could also be a clinician and be with women um, and midwifery seemed like a perfect fit of my interest in sort of some of the the social pressing issues that I see 
in our country, um, and I had wanted to work with people and work with my hands and be with families. So the now your practice, am I right that they only do home births? Yes. Okay, so we do. you do, and mm-hmm. there are three midwives there. There are four now. Four, four now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now four. There are four. So <laughs> so. Um, why? What's the philosophy behind having a practice that only does? Because a lot of midwives deliver mm-hmm. in hospitals as well. The majority well. of midwives in the United States deliver babies in hospitals. Yeah, um, that this is an option for people who are healthy candidates who are interested in having an experience um, that they are very much a mover and a shaker and a driver of, and um, that they have potentially really a belief and faith in their body's capacity to physiologically grow their baby, labor, give birth to their baby in the intimacy and comfort of their home. And um, you know, we're in very close communication with other providers, with our excellent physician backup as needed. And um, we, you know, we screen our patients very carefully. Tell, what do you mean by that? How do you screen them? Well, it's, Im- it's important Why do you screen them? because you know, we have rising rates in this country of obesity, of diabetes, of hypertension, of chronic diseases. Um, There are some people who are not necessarily the best candidates to not be um, so far from the the accessories that are available, the technology, the interventions that are immediately available in a hospital. And there are some, there are many women um, who are best served with that technology and with that expertise in a hospital. And um, so it's it's a conversation. And what are the reasons that you have women telling you they want a midwife? I assume in the conversation you say, well, why us, right? Mm-hmm. Why are they coming to you? Sure. Um, well, I, w- I think that... Um, Midwives who deliver in hospitals at home at the birth center, we have midwives provide all of those options in the United States, are all coming from a a similar philosophy that this is not a disease, this is not a disaster waiting to happen. This is a physiologic process. Your body is growing a baby, and we are here to help facilitate as healthfully and safely as possible using judicious interventions as needed and technology as needed, but to really help you facilitate your experience um, giving birth to your baby. So I, I do, I think that midwives often come with a, a real belief in the process mm-hmm. of pregnancy mm-hmm. and labor and childbirth and hopefully a lot of patience and kindness to our women, as well as real knowledge and training and, um, you know, understanding of what is the, the latest evidence as well. We have a phone call from Edith in Canton. Edith, are you there? Yes. Hi. What was it you wanted to say, Edith? Well, I'm coming from uh, a former obstetric nurse, <clears throat> pardon me, that goes back to the 1950s, where um, obviously the uh, the drug of choice was to be, uh, they called it twilight sleep, so the mother was very much at rest, <laughs> sleeping, <laughs> Um so the, the things that I have noticed over the years, uh, particularly in um, hospital settings following deliveries, whether they are sections, we are obviously is the shorter stay. Uh, back in those days, some things are better. Um, the mother stayed a week. And you thought that was better back then, you're saying? Well, because they stayed a week in mm-hmm. the hospital. Mm-hmm. They got their rest if it was child number one. They got education about how to care for the child. If there were any post-delivery uh, complications, they were right at the hospital. Um, the, um, uh, the limitation of visitors was uh, very strict. Um, uh, you know, visiting hours meant visiting hours. You could not bring babies, toddlers, uh, multiple visitors. And I know it's a happy time. It's an exciting <laughs> time. I am a mother of five. I'm very familiar with with the nursing part of it, the hospital right. policy part of it, and the Edith, let, let, let pregnancy me, part of it. You've raised something really important. So I want, I, with, with thanks, I want to cut you off right there and just and, and turn to our guest here and say, are, is that something that's been lost? Was it actually in some ways a more – was the hospital a more restful place 50 years – not that any of you was doing this 50 years ago. But is there, is there something to that? I mean my, my – one of my brothers was actually born at home. And what I remember – I was seven years old. And what I remember was that everyone was climbing on top of my mom the very next day. <laughs> and, you know, she – I mean I think – 
Oh, well, I'll leave it to my mom to call in. But uh, <laughs> it was, but the hospital might have been a more restful place for Were her. Were you with, climbing on top of I, I may have been. She already had two children. And I mean, what about that? Is there something to the kind of serenity, the kind of safe, the cordoned off space of, of, 50, of the hospital room 50 years ago? Well, I think that it can be our job um, to help create that safe space and that peaceful and calm space wherever we are providing care for our patients, whether that's one or two days after a vaginal birth in a hospital or four days after a cesarean section in a hospital or if it's at a birth center Mm -hmm. where the mom goes home a few hours later or if it's at home where the mom gives birth and then the midwives go home a few hours later. I think it's our responsibility to help educate her and her family and her loved ones about the importance of rest and recovery and um, having her really become aware that, you know, her opportunity right now is to be with her baby and hopefully to be nursing her baby and to regain and resume exercise and physical activity at a level, balanced pace. And we live in a go, go, go culture where women are doing so much. Mm -hmm. And some of that, I think our job um, is to work on that education before the baby is born, that this is really your time to be a queen in your space. (laughs) And how can we help facilitate that for you? Before we go to break, I want to take one more call. Uh, Debbie in Hartford, are you there? Yes. Hi. Yeah. What did you want to say today? Um, I am a midwife and my husband is a family physician and we had both of our children with birth and beyond. Um, and the reason that I went to them for care was because what they offer is so much more than kind of standard. So qu- quickly, I'm going to cut. I want to go to break soon, but quickly, can you just tell us like what? Is, okay, what do they offer? What is it? Be what? What more did you get from them than you think you would have gotten from a traditional practice? tremendous amount of personal attention and really getting to know each other so they knew me and my issues and how to care for me the best way. Thank you so much for calling in. Debbie. Debbie, we really appreciate it. We're taking your calls. We're talking about different varieties of birthing experience. You can call us at 860-275-7266. I'm Mark Oppenheimer sitting in for Colin McEnroe. I'm Mark Oppenheimer. This is The Colin McEnroe Show. We're talking about varieties of birthing, from the most traditional to the least traditional, shall we say. We're talking with Peter Beller, Medical Director of Women's Ambulatory Health at Hartford Hospital, Lillian Siegel, a midwife, Julie Robbins, a prenatal massage specialist, and Barbara Fasulo, the coordinator of the Center for Integrative Medicine at St. Francis Hospital. Julie, let's get you into the conversation. Um, You have a practice in prenatal massage therapy, is that right? That's right. At least 80 percent of my practice is pregnant women over the last 12 to 15 years. So how is that different from other massages? I've never had a prenatal massage, nor (laughs) nor am I likely to. I've had too few massages generally, in fact, and definitely never a prenatal one. There are a couple of differences that the women notice right away. The first is positioning. And in general, a therapist who has additional training knows that you need to put a pregnant woman in side position. So there's absolutely no pressure whatsoever on the abdomen. Um, It's the safest and most comfortable position for a woman to get massage. It leaves access to the areas that she really needs the work the most hips, low back, Mm -hmm. legs, feet. Mm -hmm. And how do women find you? Have have doctors recommended to them, like you might consider a prenatal massage? I mean, where where in in the medical complex do people become aware of what you do? It kind of works in reverse. Normally, as I build a practice, I see women coming from the yoga centers, uh-huh. from the prenatal yoga classes. Word gets out. It becomes word of mouth. Those women go back to their OBGYNs and, then, and midwives. And often then, over time, the referrals start coming back in my direction because they hear good things from their patients. I see. And now, you, this is one of those careers that I imagine didn't exist 50 years ago. I'm guessing if we right. went to the Yellow Pages 50 years ago, right, we didn't see, you know, you know, you might not have seen many massage therapists, and if you did, they weren't doing prenatal massage. Um, mm-hmm. It seems to me there's been a multiplication of different, you know, specialties, modalities, different guilds of professionals helping pregnant mothers, expectant mothers. Um, and do do you ever feel like it's being 
very, very finely sliced. Like there's, there's, and this is, I guess, a question for all of you. I mean, how big a team does an expectant mother need? You know, should everyone have a prenatal massage therapist, be doing prenatal yoga, have an acupuncturist, have a midwife, have a doula? I mean, at, at what point, you know, do we say you have the right professional staff helping you? And how does a woman know? Mark, my answer to that question yeah. actually comes in. I, I was thinking if I were asked, and I wasn't, um, <laughs> what we should name the show, I was thinking it should be um, childbirth, uh, not alternative childbirth, mm-hmm. but educated childbirth. Because okay. what I think is We are that, renaming it right now. It is right, now educated. educated when we childbirth. go to the next birth break, it's educated childbirth. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So the reason I say that is mm-hmm. because if women avail themselves to all of these different options, if they know all of the possibilities that are out there, then they can take their own individual circumstances and find the resources they need. If they have pregnancy-induced sciatica, they can go to a prenatal massage therapist who can take care of that for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if they have other concerns, they can go to other specialists. But I know that the women that come to me have physiological problems that often they're just told, oh, you just need to wait nine months till you have the baby and that pain will go away. But a massage therapist who's trained can take care of that for them. Did anyone else want to speak to that question? I would just say in my Lillian, yeah. in my ideal world, mm-hmm. we would be, you know, not everyone can afford to pay out of pocket for mm-hmm. all of those six other professions in addition to um, medical care. And so, um, you know, m- many midwives in this country are caring for women in clinics um, and women who are underinsured or are undocumented. And so how can our medical system really begin to include the massage therapist mm-hmm. and, and be able to help our, our women and our patients have access to um, additional services? Mm-hmm. Um, that's really important. But also just going back to your question, Mark, how many providers does it, how, how much does a woman need? If we look in other cultures where all of these other things aren't necessarily available, maybe those women have more family support. Maybe those women are in a system um, of, of other people helping them with their kids and helping them with their responsibilities. And women today are often, there's a lot of responsibility that they take on on their own. And so sometimes it does seem like there's so many baby products and there's so many pregnancy specialties. <laughs> this or that. Um, but. I sometimes do feel when I hear, and, and we don't have a doula on this show, though I'd love for one to call in, and maybe one of the long queue. Oh, you're a doula too. I so, am also oh a my doula. God, they're all doulas <laughs> here. All we have two out of our four guests are doulas. So sometimes when I hear doulas describe what it is that, and no doubt a certain sizable percentage of our audience is saying, what's a doula? Um, sometimes when I hear that practice described, what I want to say is, well, where's the husband? I mean, if a lot of it is, for example, caring for the mother after, if it's that kind of unmedicalized but supportive care, you know, where's mother-in-law, where's mom, where's husband, right, right Julie? So here's what I wanted to mention about that and actually say to Lillian, one of the ways that I address the financial concern, a woman who maybe can't afford massage throughout her pregnancy, um, one of the th- services I offer is a birth partner massage teaching session. Um, I'm actually going to be offering this class at Yale in the fall for mm-hmm. groups, mm-hmm. but they can come in for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and I teach the partners how to use massage for the woman while she's pregnant and also with specific pain relief techniques and relaxation techniques for during labor so that that partner can not only provide the pain relief she needs and help her stay relaxed so she's out of fight or flight, and we know that that speeds labor, but also it allows that moment, that important moment in a family um, for the partner to be connected and an active agent in the process so that the two of them end up bonding mm-hmm. over labor as opposed to that stereotype that you have of like the woman screaming, you did this to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Instead, they come out of this and then the woman proceeds to tell everyone how her partner like saved her and was like the best thing ever in her labor. And right. they're going around proud about that. And it's, it's a great thing to see. And of course, we should add that not all women have partners or not all women right? have you know male partners who are the father of their who are present. But it could right? be the mother so, or a sister or a friend Right. Anyone. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Barbara Fasulo uh, from the Center for Integrative Medicine at St. Francis, how do you answer that question of, you know, how, do, how does a woman know who, what the right size of her team is? Well, first of all, I Or think, is that the wrong question? Well, you know what I think is that now my, I gave birth to my son 26 years ago and uh, – Congratulations. And he still That's loves right. me, Great. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I think it's looking at birthing process of the joy of bringing another human life into the world versus an illness. 
And I know that when I gave birth to my son, it was the doctor was the person I had to go through for everything. And so I felt no ownership, um, no connection to actually birthing my baby Mm -hmm. or even trusting that my body knew how to birth my baby. So I kind of gave up all of my control. And in doing that, there was a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when you have fear, you have tension, which leads to pain. Mm. So I think as moms are developing these teams, like it's like sports teams, you know, basketball team have different people, baseball. So for mom, it's her individual team. And everyone that she engages is there for her, for the safety of the baby, and then also including the dad. We have a lot of callers we're going to get to in just a second, but it, am I right that the the obstetrics profession has probably come a long way and changed in response to some of the other professions urging them to be more to be less, to, shall we say, to treat pregnancy less like an illness? To use your language, I mean, my yeah. my r- encounters with you know uh, the obstetricians who my wife has seen is that they're in terms of affect indistinguishable from most of the midwives I know in terms of warmth in terms of trying to take time with their patients in terms of affect but but maybe that's been a response to other professions well I think it's uh, I mean I it certainly happened I mean and we and, and you see a difference in the residents who are coming through our program over the last 30 years I think we have fostered a more uh, kind person to, to do obstetrics. I mean, that's not that the guys who were doing it before weren't, but it was a different <laughs> approach. And it was a different approach in all of medicine. I mean, it's not just obstetrics, but there's, it's throughout, uh, throughout medicine, I think, anyway, that, that things have changed significantly. We're going to go to Allison from Bethany. Allison, are you there? Yeah, hi. Thanks so much for waiting. What was it you wanted to say to our guests? Well, I just wanted to say that I um, hypnobirthed two out of my three children, and i um, all of them in a hospital setting. We had actually interviewed um, with the home birth midwife practice, mm-hmm. but they f- kind of freaked us out. And um, how, why did they? Fr- how did they freak you out? Because the woman who we interviewed with forgot the key to the office and did the interview at a coffee shop, and she brought her daughter. So we were going over my medical history in this, like, public place, and we thought if she can't even remember the key to her office when we have a scheduled <laughs> appointment, what's going to happen if I go into labor? Is she going to remember, like, the medical kit? So what was <laughs> what was hypnobirthing? I didn't mean to take us off topic there because um, because Barbara is, in fact, a hypnobirth specialist, right? Yes. And, and so we'll hear about that from your perspective, Barbara. But, but Allison, what was your experience with hypnobirthing? So the hypnobirthing is um, – the OBGYN practice I used was totally supportive of it, and it's just like the theory is that birth is, like even saying, not a medical big problem, and it's totally natural, and it's not inherently painful, and the pain is caused by fear, and you just tense up, and if you could just relax and let your body do what it's going to do, you're going to be fine, and it was totally true. My husband and I, like did it together and we never felt closer to one another and it was fast and it was uncomfortable but it was never painful and it was super quick and I was felt better than I ever did after I gave birth to two of my two All of right. My well, thanks so much. So Barbara, tell us what from from the point of view of an educator, what is hypnobirthing? Hypnobirthing is a technique uh, the way I practice it developed by a woman by the name of Marie Mongan. And the technique is about helping moms have tools to use to reduce their experience of pain, of, of fear and anxiety, which leads to pain. So I tell them I give them like a toolbox, and the toolbox contains very specific breathing techniques. Mm-hmm. There's three of them. Use at different phases during the birthing process: visualization, um, uh, self hypnosis, affirmations, and the father which we call the birthing companion because sometimes the dad's very involved and sometimes someone else is involved instead. So I give them this toolbox of lots of different things to use so that when they go into the birthing process, they have a way to help themselves to be comfortable. We really want moms to know that they know how to birth their babies. Moms have been birthing babies forever, and babies know how to be born. So if you can kind of go with your body and if you're feeling sensation, maybe that's not actually pain you're feeling. Maybe it's just a wave that's drawing your baby closer to being born. But it, is, but, but it is pain, right? Well, what is pain? You know, it's interesting. I had a massage, a deep tissue massage done two weeks ago, really deep. Now, if anyone touched me like that out of the massage, I would have been screaming in pain. But in the massage, my mind is saying, this is really great because it's helping to relieve the tension in my body. So my mind did not say that was, was pain. Mm-hmm. It was pressure. So, so, is, so women who perceive it as pain, are they're just under an illusion or misguided? We give them, what we do is we give no. them an option. <laughs> we, what, we try to do, what we try to do is to give them an option of how, you know, it, it is discomfort. 
And so we never tell moms you're not going to have any pain or discomfort. But if you can just breathe into that and allow your body to relax because when you have pain, if your muscles tighten up, it's harder for that baby to be born because those muscles are tight. Here's my yeah, birth Julie. story with hypnobirthing with my second birth in 30 seconds. Yeah, less. sure. So I spent three hours, and I've seen labor. So I'm saying this is three hours of early labor, 30-second contractions, not very painful, manageable completely, um, 12 minutes apart. And all of a sudden, I felt the urge to push, and I was done. And that is typical of hypnobirthing. It, it speeds labor along. You don't think you're as far along as you really are because it's just not that difficult. We have to take a call from Susie because she's calling from Rhode Island, and this is proving that we truly are a global show. Susie, are you there from Providence? I sure am. <laughs> what was it that you wanted to share with our guests? Excuse me, sorry. Uh, what, what, what do you have for us today? What's up? Oh, I, um, so I'm calling because I had two children. One was with the OB practice in Boston, and um, I had a totally different experience just last summer um, with a midwife practice in New Haven. And... Um, I just, I just wanted to comment on the differences, and I think it has a lot to do with the team that you guys have been speaking of and the team of people around me. My experience in Boston was really without a team. I didn't feel so much support. I had some great nurses that helped me through some labor, but I never saw my OB until after two hours of pushing, and he came in and said, okay, we're going to section you, and I was like, what? I... I don't want to be had you had you never had you never met him before, or no, you just no, had, you, before, but not I'd during labor. He didn't come into labor, before. right? He did not appear, right? I, from the time that um, I entered the hospital till two, I did not see him until two hours after of pushing. And um, so he came in and said, "We're going to do a section," and I begged for fifteen more minutes, and we sort of went back and forth, and I pushed for another hour, and then was ultimately sectioned. Um, and later when I saw my medical record, it said maternal fatigue as the reason. And I just have been bummed. As you can tell, this is five years ago, and I'm still really You're disappointed still, yeah. about it. Um, Susie, thank but, I want to. Um, I want to take this to the guest. I think. I think you raise a really important question, and I want to. I want to know if any of our guests have thoughts I, I about have a, how, how that went. I'd yeah, like to Barbara, add something. Sure. In the hypnobirthing process, what we do is we talk to parents. It's a five-week program that we offer, two and a half hours each each session. So sure. it's a long program with lots of practice. But in the second class, we talk about birthing options, and I give forms for the parents to go home and think about um, what they want to do. How do they want their birthing process to be? Do they want to have medication? What kind? of things and then they bring that form to their physician mm -hmm. so they can have a conversation before the actual birthing takes place so the physician knows really where the parents are coming from so let me take this to peter <coughs> wouldn't wouldn't that be a would would that conversation not be happening as part of just standard protocol between a doctor and patient i think it happens i'm not sure it happens in the in-depth uh level that it might happen for some people yeah yeah. But it does happen. And Lillian, what about at your practice? Um, I think it's always really important to hear where women are coming from, what are their prior experiences, and um, you know what are, what are their hopes and fears, expectations, concerns. I don't know if um, if our caller is still in the air or not. I okay. no, no, we lost her. Right. So, um, so, and I, I want to get in one more call before the break. And uh, Lynn from Weathersfield, you had a question for the panel. Is that right, Lynn? Yes. Hello. I was wondering if the panelists um, could discuss the difference in midwifery care in America versus other countries. I'm just a lay person. I did have three children at home with midwives. Um, so my information might be a little out of date, but my understanding was that in many European countries, midwifery care is the model, and you only see a doctor if you have a high-risk pregnancy versus here in America, and, and possibly also if they could discuss the difference in different states. Maybe not for care, but Interesting, for but across, across different states in the United States. Okay, thanks so much, Lynn. Sure. So, uh, Lynn, you are correct. In many uh, countries in Western Europe, midwives do, um, the, do the majority of prenatal and labor care and birth care for women. In the United States, midwives are also doing gynecologic care, um, family planning, contraception, care for older women experiencing menopause and beyond, um, also a bunch of primary care as well. So that can be a difference a bit here in the United States. And um, in the United States, certified nurse midwives are in all 50 states um, and can provide care in homes, at birth centers, and in hospitals, so are also seen as primary care providers. We're talking about educated childbirth. We're taking your calls at 860-275-7266. I'm Mark Oppenheimer sitting in for Colin McEnroe, and we will be right back after this break. Ladies, all the pregnant ladies, all the pregnant ladies, all the pregnant ladies, all the pregnant ladies. Now put your feet up. All the pregnant ladies, all the pregnant ladies, all the pregnant ladies. Pregnant ladies. 
Today's show was produced by Patrick Scahill and me, Kion Wolf, with help from our interns, Kristen Dewar and Andrew Gates. The part of Bill Curry was played by Ina May Gaskin. On tomorrow's show, we talk about summer reading and how schools pick out those lists. And now, back to Moppy. I'm Mark Oppenheimer. We're talking about educated childbirth, all the different options, the different teams that parents need so many people to choose from. There are doulas, there are midwives, there are hypnobirthers, and then there's just obstetricians. They're still there, I think. Um, they're so uh, important. And they're, Lillian, tell us why, <laughs> why are they so important? No, Actually, I, you know I, what? I, I'm Well, you go ahead while I find the thing I want to read that a friend sent me about why they're so important. But you go ahead. Well, Lillian, what were you going to well, say? Well, I just, I, th- I think that it's important if we're having this conversation about alternatives versus is education um, that this this really is a team effort and that's why there's four of us here mm-hmm. and this needs to happen with collaboration and I think Peter was describing in his practice he is teaching residents there are nurse practitioners in his practice there are midwives in his practice Connecticut is a, de- a really good example there are midwives practicing in every county in Connecticut and there are midwives working with obstetrician gynecologists all over the state and um, it really does take multiple multiple um, avenues of support and angles and just that I think it's it's so important to realize that in America with rising rates of chronic health conditions um, there are sometimes high risk complications and things happen and that obstetricians are excellently prepared I don't know if you want to speak more to that Peter but collaboration is really really important so yeah I, think, I mean I think that it certainly at Hartford Hospital and when I was in private practice you know we worked closely with the midwifery practice uh, it's it's a collaboration. I mean, it, it's it, again, as I said earlier, we're all there to do the same thing. Right. And, uh, and some people may want to get to that in a little different way than others, and that's fine. As long as, as long as uh, we end up with healthy moms and healthy babies, I think that's what we're really trying to do. So I'm going to read a, a, an email message I got from someone I know who's who's I believe this story from him. He's someone who who's a friend of mine, and and he's talking about um, about an experience he had. He said. And I've taken the names out. He said, we most likely would have lost my wife and child if we'd gone the home birth route. When my wife was in labor, our son kicked the inner works so hard that he caused bleeding. It wasn't noticed by the people with her at the time when her water broke, so they called me and I drove her, uh, drove home from work casually. After all, it was our multiple child. I won't say which number, but – and we were pros. In retrospect, my wife was in shock from the blood loss and not very communicative when I arri- arrived home, so I took my time getting her bags. When we got to the hospital, they hooked her up to monitoring and saw immediately that something was very wrong. Two minutes after she lay down in the bed, the fetal monitor showed declining heartbeat for our son, and my wife fainted simultaneously. They had her under the knife one minute later for the emergency, c- for the emergency C-section. So that's the kind of story that you know people will talk about when they say, why would anyone – I mean, we've all heard this, right? Why, why wouldn't you have it in the hospital? just for maximal safety, right? We we read all the labels on everything. So once they're born, we don't let them have the BPH or the this or that. Why wouldn't you have it in the hospital? What do, what do you hear, guests, when you hear that narrative? Well, I would... I'm Every every example and every story is different. So with, without um, knowing the specifics, sure, and, right, right, right. Um, just to I'm say using it as a thought experiment, if, right? Yeah. If you if you do choose to have a baby born at home, you're in very close communication with your providers and very close communication with your midwives. Often the midwives would come much earlier in your labor than if you were going to the hospital. Your providers might ask you to arrive once your labor seemed a bit more active. And so if you were having a baby out of the hospital, it would be quite likely to have much more communication with your midwives. Maybe the midwives would be there earlier and the midwives would be monitoring the baby potentially much sooner than what this woman had had monitoring as soon as she arrived to the hospital. So, um, you know, vigilance is very important and there are different ways to do that in different settings that are appropriate. And I might add that everyone's really trying to do their best for the mother and the baby, but there's something to the statistic. World Health Organization said in 1912 that the United States, according to them, is 50th in maternal mortality. And that means there are 49 countries ahead of us that do a better job with this. And I just think the question needs to, we need to keep asking the question, why is that so? Mm-hmm. And so, like 100 no, no, years no. ago? Sorry, did I say 1912? Yeah. 2012. 2012. <laughs> 2012. Sorry, 2012. We were on top of the world in 1912, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably not. Probably not, right? No. So m- my point is that we, um, we need to look at where the risks are both in the hospital and, and out of the hospital and pick the right choice for that woman. Kirsten from Mystic. Are you still there, Kirsten? Yes. Thank you so much for waiting. Uh, what's up today? I just wanted to share my um, two very different birth experiences. I, um, 
I actually chose the route of having a practice that had a doctor and a midwife for that collaborative effort that you were speaking of. And um, I'm quite glad that I did. I, my first child, I actually ended up at the hospital seven centimeters dilated. So it was quite quick. Um, I really had no idea that, that I was that far along. Um, and I birthed my son naturally, um, no drugs. The midwife was the one helping me deliver my son, and the doctor was in the in the room as well. Sure. Um, and thankfully, she was there because I ended up having a retained placenta, and I lost consciousness and, and bled out, and I was immediately rushed into the OR. And I just wanted to share that um, I was very grateful that I had sort of that full experience. Um, I'm, I was unfortunate that it, it turned that took that turn at the end, but um, thankfully I was fine and my son was fine. Um, but it, it, to me, it just sort of tells the story of how um, sort of tenuous it can be. You just don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful that I did have that whole experience. And, you know, before I, before I was, um, it, that I had to retain placenta and sure. was bleeding, I, um, I was so in control, which I really appreciated that experience. And I had my, my child at Yale. And they were so supportive and they were so wonderful about allowing me to be in control. And the midwife was just there sort of, you know, guiding me through. Um, but again, thankfully, I was in the hospital environment because it was literally one door over and right. I was in the OR and they were taking care of, um, taking care of me. And Kirsten, frankly, thanks. if I wasn't there, I would, have, I would have not made it. Thanks so much for your call. I really appreciate that. I want to go to Natalie in Colchester. Uh, Natalie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. What did you want to share with us today? Um, you know, my comment is really about um, support for women and families if things don't go as expected. Um, my uh, my first son uh, was born very preterm, unexpected, unknown preterm labor on my part at uh, 24 weeks gestation, and he only lived three days. And we had a special three days with him, but after that, when he was no longer in the NICU, there was really no bereavement support. And I was surprised by that and upset by that and still somewhat angry by that. Since had a healthy baby girl, and we're blessed to have her, but I'm still surprised by the lack of bereavement support. Natalie, I'm so sorry for your loss, and, and thanks for your call. Um, what about that? I mean, are different professionals placing different emphasis on support if something doesn't go well? Um, well, I, I, Peter. there uh, used to be a program, I honestly can't tell you at this moment, between the NICU at Hartford Hospital and the University of Connecticut, and I do think that it's still uh, in in you know that it's still go ongoing for um, families who have had uh, perinatal or, or neonatal loss. So I do believe that that service is available. It may not be advertised, um, but it is you know uh, social services. Uh, are a big part of the problem, particularly in the population that I serve right now. And obviously, the closer you are to your practitioner, whoever it is, right, right. the more likely they're going to be there for you afterwards, right. I would think. Well, so. it, it's also something that um, is difficult for our young uh, physicians, midwives, whomever, uh, to learn. Um, thankfully, it doesn't happen very frequently, and it's hard to uh, teach uh, people sometimes how to approach that in the past it you know uh, if you if you watch any sort of tv show that has a a cop show and there's a uh, there's a homicide the first thing the policeman says out of his mouth is i'm sorry for your loss right. 20 years ago that never would have been said right. um so you know it's not just in medicine but it's in all aspects that I that's once, come about i once crashed into a west hartford police car <laughs> and the first thing out of the officer's mouth was are you okay and i couldn't believe i thought i've crashed into a cop car this can't be good suzanne uh from new york York. Uh, what's up today, Suzanne? 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 Oh, it seems we've lost Suzanne, so I'm going to take another call. Brianna uh, from Wyndham. Brianna, are you there? Hi there, yes. Hi. What did you want to ask our guests today or share with them? Um, what I wanted to share was my. I'm 38 years old, and um, Me my too. First, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good age. <laughs> my daughter is um, going to be 16 next week. And she was born in a very traditional hospital setting. And I chose the OB practice because there were two women in the group. And truth be told, they were the worst, <laughs> le least empathetic doctors right. I met. So lest practice. we think that you can always, the gender always predicts empathy, we, we have yeah, Brianna to tell us it ain't so. Uh, sorry. <laughs> My son, who is 14 years old, was born at home subsequently. So, um, and who attended, let me just ask you quickly, I want to get to another caller, but who attended the birth at home? 
I had a sir, I had a midwife uh, locally, and I'm pregnant again. I'm 22 oh, congratulations. weeks, two days, and Birth and Beyond is actually my provider. And uh, we will, I will plan a, another home birth. <laughs> we, birth. <laughs> we will be collecting our fees from Birth and Beyond after this show. Is, <laughs> I mean, we had no idea we'd get so many calls from Birth and Beyond. They were, Thanks, Brianna. They were not planted at all. Um, so... Uh, I wanted to take some time, but our time is quickly winding down, but I wanted to ask each of you if you were to leave, uh, before we go back to the phones, I want to make sure that we get in from each of you um, some thoughts. If you were to leave people who are maybe listening in because they're going to be pregnant, they are pregnant, they want to have a more educated um, childbirth, uh, you know, Julie, what would you, what would you leave them with? Here's what I would leave them with. This is a particular soapbox of mine. We prepare... That's what, this is the soapbox moment. I am the on show. the soapbox. Yeah, okay. Great. Great. So... I think we prepare in all of these different ways, but one of the things that I think we don't look out for is our sleep going up to pregnancy and everybody uh, going up to labor. And everybody says, oh, well, you just aren't going to get any. But I think we have to protect it and prioritize sleep. There's research that says that women, I'm going to read this now so I make sure I get it right, women who slept less than six hours a night had longer labors, 29 hours versus 18, and were 4.5 times more likely to have C sections. Wow. That's 4.5 times. That's crazy. So out of my work of working with pregnant women and listening to their needs, their physiological concerns about why they can't sleep at night and why they're not comfortable, I've actually patented an ergonomic pregnancy sleep system that is not on the market now, so don't call me to ask for one, um, but it will be in six months. And I, I feel like that's my contribution to helping sleep. women sleep better so that it hopefully will also impact what, their labors and have fewer C-sections. What's your website for them to go to where you'll update them on the, your ergonomic uh, patent? www.thewomb.com. W O M B dot biz. Ooh, you got the womb. The, the womb. womb dot biz. The womb L dot biz. Lillian of Birth and Beyond, doula, uh, midwife. What would you leave people with if they're entering the the birthing season of their lives? Sure. To again, as Julie said, be as educated as possible. I just recently was speaking to a midwife and former teacher who said, you know, women should be as educated and take this decision to find their uh, birth site and their uh, care provider as they are when they're buying a home. Um, I thought you were going to say car. car. I you were <laughs> or say a car. car. <laughs> or a car, absolutely. Really doing, doing your research. Um, and also for us to acknowledge the amount of privilege that comes with having the time and ability to choose different options. And if, if that's not part of... Uh, if that's not part of your privilege, you know, again, as educated as possible to sleep, to take care of yourself and to please try, try, try and be patient and let labor start spontaneously. That's one of your best bets for a vaginal birth. Thanks so much. Barbara from the Center for Integrative Medicine at St. Francis. Well, I happen to agree with both of you. I think it's really, you know, as moms, and I can speak because I am one, is just really knowing that you know how to birth your baby. And it's really finding the participants that are going to help you do that. Um, I do actually just came from a meeting at St. Francis with obstetricians there, so everybody's on board. But I'm, and I'm happy to hear Hartford Hospital is doing the same thing. So all of us are really on board with helping moms to have the best start of their family because the birth of a child is the most miraculous thing in the world. And whether you have one or you have five, each one is unique, and, and it's there. It's, a, it's a, just a beautiful blessing. And um, so that's what Thanks, I Thanks, Barbara. And Peter, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think to have an open mind. That, that things, you know, you may plan all you want. You may be educated as much as you can be, which is always a good thing. But things sometimes change and change rapidly. And not to stand on your principles and dis disagree with people who are really probably in a better position to make that decision mm -hmm. along with you, not for you. Occasionally I've made them for patients because they need to have the decision made quickly. But um, I think it's just to keep an open mind to realize that there's no one way to do this okay. and that lots of people are, are capable of doing that. Paulette, I'm going to take your call because I think you can do it in 30 seconds. Time is short. What's up, Paulette? I'll give it, I'll give it a try. My daughter, who was born 27 years ago with a nurse midwife pregnant and present in the hospital, has now just become a certified professional midwife. And that is a different route to becoming a midwife. That is a legal in Connecticut. It is neither legal nor illegal, but it is legal in, oh, 14 or 17 states. Uh, she went through a rigorous schooling of two years of just midwifery and has just completed a one-year internship where she was present and assisting at 100 births. Um, and I'd like your panel to talk a little bit about the, the politics of 
licensure oh, in this. Oh, Paulette, yes. with 30 seconds to go, <laughs> what all I can do is promise that Colin will have me back sometime and we'll do another show on this because I think it's a terrific topic. Good we luck haven't, to your daughter. We haven't thank begun you. to exa exhaust it. And I want to thank uh, Peter Beller from Hartford Hospital, Lillian Siegel of Birth and Beyond, Julie Robbins from thewomb.biz, and Barbara uh, Filosulo from St. Francis Hospital. Thanks to Colin for letting me sit in. I'll be back tomorrow. I can't wait to show you you can fly I'm thinking about first steps in my rides And I haven't even heard you cry